My World and Welcome to It by James Thurber. This book consists of 310 pages and contains 30 stories and an appendix grouped in two parts. The following information appears on the dust jacket of the book. The world of Thurber is splendidly sampled in this collection of 30 stories, sketches, and articles that range from the wildest comedy to the serious business of murder. Animal courtship, housemaids, Macbeth, baseball, sailing, husbands and wives, the absurdities and frustrations of modern life all fall within Thurber's scope. He writes with equal brilliance about an interview with a lemming, travel in pre-war France, the Hall Mills murder case, and an encounter with the Connecticut Motor Vehicle Bureau. And the unique world of Thurber is no better represented here than in such short stories as The Whip Poor Will, You Could Look It Up, and The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Few writers have recreated daydreams and nightmares as Thurber recreates them. He manages somehow to pin them while the nerve filaments are alive and wriggling. These are all brilliant sketches. They have the crisp flavor of things recorded as they happened an interesting mixture of fancy, fact, and philosophy of the humorous and the macabre. New York Times Book Review. Acknowledgements. Most of the pieces brought together in this book were first printed in the New Yorker, the majority of them as casuals, a few under such standing departmental headings as a reporter at large, onward and upward with the arts, our footloose correspondence, and where are they now? You Could Look It Up was published in the Saturday Evening Post, The Story of Sailing in the Bermudian, and three or four of the shorter sketches in PM. Journey to the Pyrenees has not been published before. I am indebted to Mr. Edward O'Toole for his competent gathering of much of the material for the article on the Hall Mills case. For Norma and Elliot Nugent. Part One. What do you mean it was Brillig? I was sitting at my typewriter one afternoon several weeks ago, staring at a piece of blank white paper when Della walked in. They are here with the Reeves, she said. It did not surprise me that they were. With a colored woman like Della in the house, it would not surprise me if they showed up with the toves. In Della's afternoon, it is always brillig. She could outgrabe a mom wrath on any wave in the world. Only Lewis Carroll would have understood Della completely. I try hard enough. Let them wait a minute, I said. I got out the big century dictionary and put it on my lap and looked up Reeve. It is an interesting word, like all of Della's words. I found out that there are four kinds of Reeves. Are they here with strings of onions, I asked. Della said they were not. Are they here with enclosures or pens for cattle, poultry, or pigs, sheepfolds? Della said, no, sir. Are they here with administrative officers? From a little nearer the door, Della said no again. Then they've got to be here, I said with some females of the common European sandpiper. These scenes of ours take as much out of Della as they do out of me, but she is not a woman to be put down by a crazy man with a dictionary. They are here with the reeves for the windows, said Della with brave stubbornness. Then, of course, I understood what they were there with. They were there with the Christmas wreaths for the windows. Oh, those reeves, I said. We were both greatly relieved. We both laughed. Della and I never quite reach the breaking point. We just come close to it. Della is a New England colored woman with nothing of the South in her accent. She doesn't say D for T-H, and she pronounces her R's. Hearing her talk in the next room, you might not know at first that she was colored. You might not know till she said some such thing as, Do you want cretons in the soup tonight? She makes wonderful cretons for the soup. I have not found out much about Della's words, but I have learned a great deal about her background. She told me one day that she has three brothers, and that one of them works into a garage, and another works into an incinerator where they burn the refuge. The one that works into the incinerator has been working into it since the Armitage. That's what Della does to you. She gives you incinerator perfectly, and then she comes out with the Armitage. I spent most of an hour one afternoon trying to figure out what was wrong with the Armitage. I thought of Armistead, and Armature, or Armentier, and when I finally hit on Armistice, it sounded crazy. It still does. Della's third and youngest brother is my favorite. I think he'll be yours, too, and everybody else's. 
His name is Arthur, and it seems that he has just passed with commendably high grades his silver service eliminations. Della is delighted about that, but she is not half so delighted about it as I am. Della came to our house in Connecticut some months ago, trailing her glory of cloudiness. I can place the date for you approximately. It was while there were still a great many Fletchers about. The lawn is full of Fletchers, Della told me one morning shortly after she arrived when she brought up my orange juice. You mean neighbors, I said, this early? By the way she laughed, I knew that Fletchers weren't people, at least not people of flesh and blood. I got dressed and went downstairs and looked up the word in the indispensable century. A Fletcher, I found, is a man who makes arrows. I decided, but without a great deal of conviction, that there couldn't be any arrow makers on my lawn at that hour in the morning and at this particular period in history. I walked cautiously out the back door and around to the front of the house, and there they were. I don't know many birds, but I do know flickers. A flicker is a bird which, if it were really named Fletcher, would be called Flicker by all the colored cooks in the United States. Out of a mild curiosity, I looked up Flicker in the dictionary, and I discovered that he is a bird of several aliases. When Della brought my toast and coffee into the dining room, I told her about this. Fletchers, I said, are also golden-winged woodpeckers, yellow hammers, and high holders. For the first time, Della gave me the look that I was to recognize later during the scene about the Reeves. I have become very familiar with that look, and I believe I know the thoughts that lie behind it. Della was puzzled at first because I work at home instead of in an office, but I think she has it figured out now. This man, she thinks, used to work into an office like anybody else but he had to be sent to an institution. He got well enough to come home from the institution, but he is still not well enough to go back to the office. I could have avoided all these suspicions, of course, if I had simply come out in the beginning and corrected Della when she got words wrong. Coming at her obliquely with a dictionary only enriches the confusion. But I wouldn't have it any other way. I share with Della a form of escapism that is the most mystic and satisfying flight from actuality I have ever known. It may not always comfort me, but it never ceases to beguile me. Every Thursday, when I drive Della to Waterbury in the car for her day off, I explore the dark depths and the strange recesses of her nomenclature. I found out that she had been married for ten years, but was now divorced. That is, her husband went away one day and never came back. When I asked her what he did for a living, she said he worked into a dove wedding. Into a what, I asked? Into a dove wedding, said Della. It is one of the words I haven't figured out yet, but I am still working on it. Where are you from, Mr. Thurl? She asked me one day. I told her Ohio, and she said, oh, to be sure, as if I had given her a clue to my crazy definitions, my insensitivity to the ordinary household nouns, and my ignorance of the commoner migratory birds. Semantics, Ohio, I said. Why, there's one of them in Massachusetts, too, said Della. The one I mean, I told her, is bigger and more confusing. I'll bet it is, said Della. Della told me the other day that she had had only one sister, a beautiful girl who died when she was 21. That's too bad, I said. What was the matter? Della had what was the matter with her at her tongue's tip. She got tuberculosis from her teeth, she said, and it went all through her symptom. I didn't know what to say to that, except that my teeth were all right, but that my symptom could probably be easily gone all through. You know too much with your brain, said Della. I knew she was trying to draw me out about my brain and what had happened to it, so that I could no longer work into an office, but I changed the subject. There is no doubt that Della is considerably worried about my mental condition. One morning, when I didn't get up till noon, because I had been writing letters until three o'clock, Della told my wife at breakfast what was the matter with me. His mind works so fast his body can't keep up with it, she said. This diagnosis has shaken me not a little. I have decided to sleep longer and work less. I know exactly what will happen to me if my mind gets so far ahead of my body that my body can't catch up with it. They will come with a reeve, and this time it won't be a red and green one for the window. It will be a black one for the door. courtship through the ages. Surely nothing in the astonishing scheme of life can have nonplussed nature so much as the fact that none of the females of any of the species she created really cared very much for the male as such. 
For the past 10 million years, nature has been busily inventing ways to make the male attractive to the female. But the whole business of courtship, from the marine annelids up to man, still lumbers heavily along like a complicated musical comedy. I have been reading the sad and absorbing story in Volume 6, Cold to Dama, of the Encyclopedia Britannica. In this volume, you can learn all about cricket, cotton, costume designing, crocodiles, crown jewels, and Coleridge, but none of these subjects is so interesting as the courtship of animals, which recounts the sorrowful lengths to which all males must go to arouse the interest of a lady. We all know, I think, that nature gave man whiskers and a mustache with the quaint idea in mind that these would prove attractive to the female. We all know that far from attracting her, whiskers and mustaches only made her nervous and gloomy, so that man had to go in for somersaults, tilting with lances and performing feats of parlor magic to win her attention. He also had to bring her candy, flowers, and the furs of animals. It is common knowledge that in spite of all these love displays, the male is constantly being turned down, insulted, or thrown out of the house. It is rather comforting, then, to discover that the peacock, for all his gorgeous plumage, does not have a particularly easy time in courtship. None of the males in this world do. The first peahen, it turned out, was only faintly stirred by her suitor's beautiful train. She would often go quietly to sleep while he was whisking it around. The Britannica tells us that the peacock actually had to learn a certain little trick to wake her up and revive her interest. He had to learn to vibrate his quills so as to make a rustling sound. In ancient times, man himself, observing the ways of the peacock, probably tried vibrating his whiskers to make a rustling sound. If so, it didn't get him anywhere. He had to go in for something else. So, among other things, he went in for gifts. It is not unlikely that he got this idea from certain flies and birds who were making no headway at all with rustling sound. One of the flies of the family, Empidae, who had tried everything, finally hit on something pretty special. He contrived to make a glistening, transparent balloon, which was even larger than himself. Into this he would put sweetmeats and tidbits, and he would carry the whole elaborate envelope through the air to the lady of his choice. This amused her for a time, but she finally got bored with it. She demanded silly little colorful presents, something that you couldn't eat, but that would look nice around the house. So the male empis had to go around gathering flower petals, and pieces of bright paper to put into his balloon. On a courtship flight, a male empis cuts quite a figure now, but he can hardly be said to be happy. He never knows how soon the female will demand heavier presents, such as Roman coins and gold collar buttons. It seems probable that one day the courtship of the empidae will fall down, as man's occasionally does, of its own weight. The bowerbird is another creature that spends so much time courting the female that he never gets any work done. If all the male bowerbirds became nervous wrecks within the next 10 or 15 years, it would not surprise me. The female bowerbird insists that a playground be built for her with a specially constructed bower at the entrance. This bower is much more elaborate than an ordinary nest and is harder to build. It costs a lot more, too. The female will not come to the playground until the male has filled it up with a great many gifts. Silvery leaves, red leaves, rose petals, shells, beads, berries, bones, dice, buttons, cigar bands, Christmas seals, and the Lord knows what else. When the female finally condescends to visit the playground, she is in a coy and silly mood and has to be chased in and out of the bower and up and down the playground before she will quit giggling and stand still long enough even to shake hands. The male bird is, of course, pretty well done in before the chase starts, because he has worn himself out hunting for eyeglass lenses and begonia blossoms. I imagine that many a bower bird, after chasing a female for two or three hours, says the hell with it and goes home to bed. Next day, of course, he telephones someone else, and the same trying ritual is gone through with again. A male bower bird is as exhausted as a nightclub habitué before he is out of his twenties. The male fiddler crab has a somewhat easier time, but it can hardly be said that he is sitting pretty. He has one enormously large and powerful claw, usually brilliantly colored, and you might suppose that all he had to do was reach out and grab some passing cutie. The very earliest fiddler crabs may have tried this, but if so, they got slapped for their pains. A female fiddler crab will not tolerate any caveman stuff. 
She never has, and she doesn't intend to start now. To attract a female, a fiddler crab has to stand on tiptoe and brandish his claw in the air. If any female in the neighborhood is interested, and you'd be surprised how many are not, she comes over and engages him in light badinage, for which he is not in the mood. As many as a hundred females may pass the time of day with him and go on about their business. By nightfall of an average courting day, a fiddler crab who has been standing on tiptoe for eight or ten hours, waving a heavy claw in the air, is in pretty sad shape. As in the case of the males of all species, however, he gets out of bed next morning, dashes some water on his face, and tries again. The next time you encounter a male web-spinning spider, stop and reflect that he is too busy worrying about his love life to have any desire to bite you. Male web-spinning spiders have a tougher life than any other males in the animal kingdom. This is because the female web-spinning spiders have very poor eyesight. If a male lands on a female's web, she kills him before he has time to lay down his cane and gloves, mistaking him for a fly or a bumblebee who has stumbled into her trap. Before the species figured out what to do about this, millions of males were murdered by ladies they called on. It is the nature of spiders to perform a little dance in front of the female. But before a male spinner could get near enough for the female to see who he was and what he was up to, she would lash out at him with a flat iron or a pair of garden shears. One night, nobody knows when, a very bright male spinner lay awake worrying about calling on a lady who had been killing suitors right and left. It came to him that this business of dancing as a love display wasn't getting anybody anywhere except the grave. He decided to go in for web twitching or strand vibrating. The next day, he tried it on one of the nearsighted girls. Instead of dropping in on her suddenly, he stayed outside the web and began monkeying with one of its strands. He twitched it up and down and in and out with such a lilting rhythm that the female was charmed. The serenade worked beautifully. The female let him live. The Britannica's spider watchers, however, report that this system is not always successful. Once in a while, even now, a female will fire three bullets into a suitor or run him through with a kitchen knife. She keeps threatening him from the moment he strikes the first low notes on the outside strings. But usually, by the time he has got up to the high notes played around the center of the web, he is going to town and she spares his life. Even the butterfly, as handsome a fellow as he is, can't always win a mate merely by fluttering around and showing off. Many butterflies have to have scent scales on their wings. Happy Alice carries a powder puff in a perfumed pouch. He throws perfume at the ladies when they pass. The male tree cricket, Oceanthus, goes Happy Alice one better by carrying a tiny bottle of wine with him and giving drinks to such doxies as he has designs on. One of the male snails throws darts to entertain the girls. So it goes through the long list of animals, from the bristle worm and his rudimentary dance steps, to man and his gift of diamonds and sapphires. The golden eye drake raises a jet of water with his feet as he flies over a lake. Happy Alice has his powder puff. Oceanthus, his wine bottle. Man, his etchings. It is a bright and melancholy story. The age-old desire of the male for the female. The age-old desire of the female to be amused and entertained. Of all the creatures on earth, the only males who could be figured as putting any irony into their courtship are the grebes and certain other diving birds. Every now and then a courting grebe slips quietly down to the bottom of a lake and then with a mighty whoosh pops out suddenly a few feet from his girlfriend, splashing water all over her. She seems to be persuaded that this is a purely loving display, but I like to think that the grebe always has a faint hope of drowning her or scaring her to death. I will close this investigation into the mournful burdens of the male with the Britannica's story about a certain Argus pheasant. It appears that the Argus displays himself in front of a female who stands perfectly still without moving a feather. If you saw June Moon some years ago, and remember the scene in which the songwriter sang Montana Moon to his grim and motionless wife, you have some idea what the female Argus probably thinks of her mate's display. The male Argus the Britannica tells about was confined in a cage with a female of another species, a female who kept moving around, emptying ashtrays and fussing with lampshades, all the time the male was showing off his talents. Finally, in disgust, he stalked away and began displaying in front of his water trough. 
He reminds me of a certain male, Homo sapiens, of my acquaintance, who one night after dinner asked his wife to put down her detective magazine so that he could read her a poem of which he was very fond. She sat quietly enough until he was well into the middle of the thing, intoning with great ardor and intensity. Then suddenly there came a sharp, disconcerting slap it turned out that all during the male's display, the female had been intent on a circling mosquito and had finally trapped it between the palms of her hand. The male in this case did not stalk away and display in front of a water trough. He went over to Tim's and had a flock of drinks and recited the poem to the fellows. I am sure they all told bitter stories of their own about how their displays had been interrupted by females. I am also sure that they all ended up singing, Honey, Honey, Bless Your Heart. The Whip Poor Will The night had just begun to get pale around the edges when the Whip Poor Will began. Kinstray, who slept in a back room on the first floor, facing the meadow and the strip of woods beyond, heard a blind man tapping and a bugle calling and a woman screaming, Help! Police! The sergeant in gray was cutting open envelopes with a sword. Sit down there, sit down there, sit down there, he chanted at Kinstray. Sit down there, cut your throat, cut your throat. Whip poor will, whip poor will, whip poor will. And Kinstray woke up. He opened his eyes but lay without moving for several minutes, separating the fantastic morning from the sounds and symbols of his dream. There was the palest wash of light in the room. Kinstray scowled through tousled hair at his wristwatch and saw that it was ten minutes past four. Whip poor Will, whip poor Will, whip poor Will. The bird sounded very near in the grass outside the window, perhaps. Kinstray got up and went to the window in his bare feet and looked out. You couldn't tell where the thing was. The sound was all around you, incredibly loud and compelling and penetrating. Kinstray had never heard a whip poor Will so near at hand before. He had heard them as a boy in Ohio and the country, but he remembered their call as faint and plaintive and far away, dying before long somewhere between the hills and the horizon. You didn't hear the bird often in Ohio, it came back to him, and it almost never ventured as close to a house or barn as this brazen-breasted bird murdering sleep out there along the fence line somewhere. Whip poor Will, whip poor Will, whip poor Will. Kinstray climbed back into bed and began to count. The bird did 27 whips without pausing. His lungs must be built like a pelican's pouch, or a puffin, or a penguin, or a pemmican, or a paladin. It was bright daylight when Kinstray fell asleep again. At breakfast, Madge Kinstray, looking cool and well-rested in her white PK housecoat, poured the coffee with steady authority. She raised her eyebrows slightly in mild surprise when Kinstray mentioned the whip poor Will the second time. She had not listened the first time, for she was lost in exploring with a long, sensitive finger an infinitesimal chip on the rim of her coffee cup. Whip poor Will, she said finally. No, I didn't hear it. Of course, my room is on the front of the house. You must have been slept out and ready to wake up anyway, or you wouldn't have heard it. Ready to wake up, said Kinstray, at four o'clock in the morning? I hadn't slept three hours. Well, I didn't hear it, said Mrs. Kinstray. I don't listen for night noises. I don't even hear the crickets or the frogs. Neither do I, said Kinstray. It's not the same thing. This thing is loud as a fire bell. You can hear it for a mile. I didn't hear it, she said, buttering a piece of thin toast. Kinstray gave it up and turned his scowling attention to the headlines in the Herald Tribune of the day before. The vision of his wife sleeping quietly in her canopied four-poster came between his eyes and the ominous headlines. Madge always slept quietly, almost without moving, her arms straight and still outside the covers, her fingers relaxed. She did not believe anyone had to toss and turn. It's a notion, she would tell Kinstray. Don't let your nerves get the best of you. Use your willpower. Mm-hmm, said Kinstray aloud, not meaning to. Yes, sir, said Arthur, the Kinstray's colored butler, offering Kinstray a plate of hot blueberry muffins. Nothing, said Kinstray, looking at his wife. Did you hear the whip poor Will, Arthur? No, sir, I didn't, said Arthur. Did Margaret? 
I don't think she did, sir, said Arthur. She didn't say anything about it. The next morning, the whip poor will began again at the same hour, rolling out its loops and circles of sound across the new day. Kinstray, in his dreams, was beset by trios of little bearded men rolling hoops at him. He tried to climb up onto a gigantic Ferris wheel, whose swinging seats were rumpled beds. The round cop with wheels for feet rolled toward him, shouting, Willpower will! Willpower will! Whip poor will! Kinstray opened his eyes and stared at the ceiling and began to count the whips. At one point, the bird did fifty-three straight without pausing. I suppose, like the drops of water or the bright light in the third degree, this could drive you nuts, Kinstray thought, or make you confess. He began to think of things he hadn't thought of for years. The time he took the quarter from his mother's pocketbook. The time he steamed open a letter addressed to his father. It was from his teacher in the eighth grade. Miss, let's see, Miss Willpool. Miss Whippoor, Miss Willpower, Miss Wilmot, that was it. He had reached the indiscretions of his middle twenties when the Whippoor Will suddenly stopped on poor, not on will. Something must have frightened it. Kinstray sat up on the edge of the bed and lighted a cigarette and listened. The bird was through calling all right, but Kinstray couldn't go back to sleep. The day was as bright as a flag. He got up and dressed. I thought you weren't going to smoke cigarettes before breakfast anymore, said Madge later. I found four stubs in the ashtray in your bedroom. It was no use telling her he had smoked them before going to bed. You couldn't fool Madge. She always knew. That goddamn bird woke me up again, he said, and this time I couldn't get back to sleep. He passed her his empty coffee cup. It did fifty-three without stopping this morning, he added. I don't know how the hell it breathes. His wife took his coffee cup and set it down firmly. Not three cups, she said, not with you sleeping so restlessly the way it is. You didn't hear it, I suppose, he said. She poured herself some more coffee. No, she said, I didn't hear it. Margaret hadn't heard it either, but Arthur had. Kinstray talked to them in the kitchen while they were clearing up after breakfast. Arthur said that it woke him, but he went right back to sleep. He said he slept like a log. Must be the air off the ocean. As for Margaret, she always slept like a log. Only thing ever kept her awake was people a-hoopin' and a-hollerin'. She was glad she didn't hear the whip poor will. Down where she came from, she said, if you heard a whip poor will singing near the house, it meant there was going to be a death. Arthur said he had heard about that, too. Must have been his grandma told him or somebody. If a whip poor will singing near the house meant death, Kinstray told them, it wouldn't really make any difference whether you heard it or not. It doesn't make any difference whether you see the ladder you're walking under, he said, lighting a cigarette and watching the effect of his words on Margaret. She turned from putting some plates away, and her eyes widened and rolled a little. Mr. Kinstray is just teasing you, Mag, said Arthur, who smiled and was not afraid. Thinks he's pretty smart, Kinstray thought. Just a little bit too smart, maybe. Kinstray remembered Arthur's way of smiling almost imperceptibly at things Mrs. Kinstray sometimes said to her husband when Arthur was just coming into the room or just going out, little things that were none of his business to listen to, like not three cups of coffee if a bird keeps you awake. Wasn't that what she had said? Is there any more coffee, he asked testily, or did you throw it out? He knew they had thrown it out. Breakfast had been over for almost an hour. We can make you some fresh, said Arthur. Never mind, said Kinstray. Just don't be so sure of yourself. There's nothing in life to be sure about. When, later in the morning, he started out the gate to walk down to the post office, Madge called to him from an upstairs window. Where are you going? she asked, amiably enough. He frowned up at her. To the taxidermists, he said, and went on. He realized, as he walked along in the warm sunlight, that he had made something of a spectacle of himself just because he hadn't had enough sleep or enough coffee. It wasn't his fault, though. It was that infernal bird. He discovered after a quarter of a mile that the imperative rhythm of the whip poor Will's call was running through his mind, but the words of the song were new. Fatal bell, fatal bell, fatal bell. Now, where had that popped up from? It took him some time to place it. It was a fragment from Macbeth. 
there was something about the fatal bellman crying in the night. The fatal bellman cried the live long night, something like that. It was an owl that cried the night Duncan was murdered. Funny thing to call up after all these years. He hadn't read the play since college. It was that fool Margaret talking about the whippoorwill and the superstition that if you hear the whippoorwill singing near the house, it means there is going to be a death. Here it was, 1942, and people still believed in stuff like that. The next dawn, the dream induced by the calling of the whippoorwill was longer and more tortured, a nightmare filled with dark perils and heavy hopelessness. Kinstray woke up, trying to cry out. He lay there breathing hard and listening to the bird. He began to count. One, two, three, four, five. Then suddenly he leaped out of bed and ran to the window and began yelling and pounding on the window pane and running the blind up and down. He shouted and cursed until his voice got hoarse. The bird kept right on going. He slammed the window down and turned away from it, and there was Arthur in the doorway. What is it, Mr. Kinstray? said Arthur. He was fumbling with the end of a faded old bathrobe and trying to blink the sleep out of his eyes. Is anything the matter? Kinstray glared at him. Get out of here, he shouted, and put some coffee on or get me a brandy or something. I'll put some coffee on, said Arthur. He went shuffling away in his slippers, still half asleep. Well, said Madge Kinstray over her coffee cup at breakfast, I hope you got your tantrum over and done with this morning. I never heard such a spectacle, squalling like a spoiled brat. You can't hear spectacles, said Kinstray coldly. You see them. I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about, she said. No, you don't, thought Kinstray. You never have. Never have. Never have. Never have. Would he ever get that damned rhythm out of his head? It struck him that perhaps Madge had no subconscious. When she lay on her back, her eyes closed. When she got up, they opened like a doll's. The mechanism of her mind was as simple as a cigarette box. It was either open or it was closed, and there was nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. The whole problem turns on a very neat point, Kinstray thought as he lay awake that night, drumming on the headboard with his fingers. William James would have been interested in it. Henry, too, probably. I've got to ignore this thing, get adjusted to it, become oblivious of it. I mustn't fight it, I mustn't build it up. If I get to screaming at it, I'll be running across that wet grass out there in my bare feet, charging that bird as if it were a trench full of Germans, throwing rocks at it, giving the rebel yell or something, for God's sake. No, I mustn't build it up. I'll think of something else every time it pops into my mind. I'll name the Dodger infield to myself over and over. Camille, Herman, Reese, Vaughn, Camille, Herman, Reese. Kinstray did not succeed in becoming oblivious of the whippoorwill. Its dawn call pecked away at his dreams like a vulture at a heart. It slowly carved out a recurring nightmare in which Kinstray was attacked by an umbrella whose handle, when you clutched it, clutched right back, for the umbrella was not an umbrella at all, but a raven. Through the gloomy hallways of his mind rang the thing's dolorous cry, Nevermore, 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 whippoorwill, whippoorwill. One day, Kinstray asked Mr. Tetford at the post office if the whippoorwills ever went away. Mr. Tetford squinted at him. Don't look like the sun was browning up you none, he said. I don't know as they ever go away. They move around. I like to hear them. You get used to them. Sure, said Kinstray. What do people do when they can't get used to them, though? I mean, old ladies or sick people. Only one's been bothered was old Miss Purdy. She darn near set fire to the whole island trying to burn them out of her woods. Shooting at them might drive them off, or a body could trap them easy enough and let them loose somewhere else. But people get used to them after a few mornings. Oh, sure, said Kinstray. Oh, sure. That evening in the living room, when Arthur brought in the coffee, Kinstray's cup cackled idiotically in its saucer when he took it off the tray. Madge Kinstray laughed. Your hand is shaking like a leaf, she said. He drank all his coffee at once and looked up savagely. If I could get one good night's sleep, it might help, he said. That damn bird, I'd like to wring its neck. Oh, come now, she said mockingly. You wouldn't hurt a fly. 
Remember the mouse we caught in the Westport house? You took it out in the field and let it go. The trouble with you, he began and stopped. He opened the lid of a cigarette box and shut it, opened and shut it again reflectively. As simple as that, he said. She dropped her amused smile and spoke shortly. You're acting like a child about that silly bird, she said. Worse than a child. I was over at the Barry's this afternoon. Even their little Anne didn't make such a fuss. A whip poor will frightened her the first morning, but now she never notices them. I'm not frightened, for God's sake, shouted Kinstray. Frightened or brave, asleep or awake, open or shut, you make everything black or white. Well, she said, I like that. I think the bird wakes you up, too, he said. I think it wakes up Arthur and Margaret. And we just pretend it doesn't, she asked. Why on earth should we? Oh, out of some fool notion of superiority, I suppose. Out of, I don't know. I'll thank you not to class me with the servants, she said coldly. He lighted a cigarette and didn't say anything. You're being ridiculous and childish, she said, fussing about nothing at all, like an invalid in a wheelchair. She got up and started from the room. Nothing at all, he said, watching her go. She turned at the door. Ted Barry says he'll take you on at tennis if your bird hasn't worn you down too much. She went on up the stairs, and he heard her close the door of her room. He sat smoking moodily for a long time and fell to wondering whether the man's wife in The Raven had seen what the man had seen perched on the pallid bust of Pallas just above the chamber door. Probably not, he decided. When he went to bed, he lay awake a long while trying to think of the last line of The Raven. He couldn't get any farther than like a demon that is dreaming, and this kept running through his head. Nuts, he said at last aloud, and he had the oddly disturbing feeling that it wasn't he who had spoken, but somebody else. Kinstray was not surprised that Madge was a little girl in pigtails and a play suit. The long gray hospital room was filled with poor men in wheelchairs, running their long, sensitive fingers around the rims of empty coffee cups. Poor Will, poor Will, chanted Madge, pointing her finger at him. Here are your spectacles, here are your spectacles. One of the sick men was Arthur, grinning at him, grinning at him and holding him with one hand, so that he was powerless to move his arms or legs. Her to fly, her to fly, chanted Madge. Whip him now, whip him now, she cried. And she was the umpour in the high chair beside the court, holding a black umbrella over her head. Love thirty, love forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four. His feet were stuck in the wet concrete on his side of the net, and Margaret peered over the net at him, holding a skillet for a racket. Arthur was pushing him down now, and he was caught in the concrete from head to foot. It was Madge, laughing and counting over him. Refer three, refer four, refer five, refer will, reaper will, whipper will, whipper will, whipper will. The dream still clung to Kinstray's mind like a cobweb as he stood in the kitchen in his pajamas and bare feet, wondering what he wanted, what he was looking for. He turned on the cold water in the sink and filled a glass, but only took a sip and put it down. He left the water running. He opened the bread box and took out half a loaf wrapped in oiled paper and pulled open a drawer. He took out the bread knife and then put it back and took out the long, sharp carving knife. He was standing there holding the knife in one hand and the bread in the other when the door to the dining room opened. It was Arthur. Who do you do first? Kinstray said to him hoarsely. The Barrys, on their way to the beach in their station wagon, drove into the driveway between the house and the barn. They were surprised to see that at a quarter to eleven in the morning, the Kinstray servants hadn't taken in the milk. The bottle, standing on the small back porch, was hot to Barry's touch. When he couldn't rouse anyone, pounding and calling, he climbed up on the cellar door and looked in the kitchen window. He told his wife sharply to get back in the car. The local police and the state troopers were in and out of the house all day. It wasn't every morning in the year that you got called out on a triple murder and suicide. It was just getting dark when troopers Baird and Lennon came out of the front door and walked to their car, pulled up beside the road in front of the house. Out and back, probably in the little strip of wood there, Lennon figured a whip poor will began to call. Lennon listened a minute. 
You ever hear the old people say a whippoorwill singing near the house means death, he asked. Baird grunted and got in under the wheel. Lennon climbed in beside him. Take more than a whippoorwill to cause a mess like that, said Trooper Baird, starting the car. The Macbeth Murder Mystery It was a stupid mistake to make, said the American woman I had met at my hotel in the English Lake Country. But it was on the counter with the other penguin books, the little sixpenny ones, you know, with the paper covers. And I supposed, of course, it was a detective story. All the others were detective stories. I'd read all the others, so I bought this one without really looking at it carefully. You can imagine how mad I was when I found out it was Shakespeare. I murmured something sympathetically. I don't see why the Penguin Books people had to get out Shakespeare's plays in the same size and everything as the detective stories, went on my companion. I think they have different colored jackets, I said. Well, I didn't notice that, she said. Anyway, I got real comfy in bed that night and all ready to read a good mystery story, and here I had The Tragedy of Macbeth, a book for high school students like Ivanhoe, or Lorna Doone, I said. Exactly, said the American lady. And I was just crazy for a good Agatha Christie or something. Hercule Poirot is my favorite detective. Is he the rabbity one, I asked. Oh, no, said my crime fiction expert. He's the Belgian one. You're thinking of Mr. Pinkerton, the one that helps Inspector Bull. He's good, too. Over her second cup of tea, my companion began to tell the plot of a detective story that had fooled her completely. It seems it was the old family doctor all the time, but I cut in on her. Tell me, I said, did you read Macbeth? I had to read it, she said. There wasn't a scrap of anything else to read in the whole room. Did you like it? I asked. No, I did not, she said decisively. In the first place, I don't think for a moment that Macbeth did it. I looked at her blankly. Did what? I asked. I don't think for a moment that he killed the king, she said. I don't think the Macbeth woman was mixed up in it either. You suspect them the most, of course, but those are the ones that are never guilty, or shouldn't be anyway. I'm afraid, I began, that I... But don't you see, said the American lady, it would spoil everything if you could figure out right away who did it. Shakespeare was too smart for that. I've read that people never have figured out Hamlet, so it isn't likely Shakespeare would have made Macbeth as simple as it seems. I thought this over while I filled my pipe. Who do you suspect, I asked suddenly. Macduff, she said promptly. Good God, I whispered softly. Oh, Macduff did it all right, said the murder specialist. Hercule Poirot would have got him easily. How did you figure it out, I demanded. Well, she said, I didn't right away. At first I suspected Banquo, and then, of course, he was the second person killed. That was good right in there, that part. The person you suspect of the first murder should always be the second victim. Is that so? I murmured. Oh, yes, said my informant. They have to keep surprising you. Well, after the second murder, I didn't know who the killer was for a while. How about Malcolm and Donald Bain? the king's sons, I asked. As I remember it, they fled right after the first murder. That looks suspicious. Too suspicious, said the American lady. Much too suspicious. When they flee, they're never guilty. You can count on that. I believe, I said, I'll have a brandy, and I summoned the waiter. My companion leaned toward me, her eyes bright, her teacup quivering. Do you know who discovered Duncan's body? She demanded. I said I was sorry, but I had forgotten. Macduff discovers it, she said, slipping into the historical present. Then he comes running downstairs and shouts, Confusion has broke open the Lord's anointed temple, and sacrilegious murder has made his masterpiece, and on and on like that. The good lady tapped me on the knee. All that stuff was rehearsed, she said. You wouldn't say a lot of stuff like that offhand, would you, if you had found a body? She fixed me with a glittering eye. I, I began. You're right, she said. You wouldn't, unless you had practiced it in advance. My God, there's a body in here, is what an innocent man would say. She sat back with a confident glare. I thought for a while. But what do you make of the third murderer, I asked. 
You know, the third murderer has puzzled Macbeth scholars for 300 years. That's because they never thought of Macduff, said the American lady. It was Macduff, I'm certain. You couldn't have one of the victims murdered by two ordinary thugs. The murderer always has to be somebody important. But what about the banquet scene, I asked her after a moment. How do you account for Macbeth's guilty actions there when Banquo's ghost came in and sat in his chair? The lady leaned forward and tapped me on the knee again. There wasn't any ghost, she said. A big, strong man like that doesn't go around seeing ghosts, especially in a brightly lighted banquet hall with dozens of people around. Macbeth was shielding somebody. Who was he shielding, I asked. Mrs. Macbeth, of course, she said. He thought she did it, and he was going to take the rap himself. The husband always does that when the wife is suspected. But what, I demanded, about the sleepwalking scene, then? The same thing, only the other way around, said my companion. That time she was shielding him. She wasn't asleep at all. Do you remember where it says, Enter Lady Macbeth with a taper? Yes, I said. Well, people who walk in their sleep never carry lights, said my fellow traveler. They have a second sight. Did you ever hear of a sleepwalker carrying a light? No, I said, I never did. Well, then she wasn't asleep. She was acting guilty to shield Macbeth. I think, I said, I'll have another brandy, and I called the waiter. When he brought it, I drank it rapidly and rose to go. I believe I said that you have got hold of something. Would you lend me that, Macbeth? I'd like to look it over tonight. I don't feel somehow as if I'd ever really read it. I'll get it for you, she said, but you'll find that I am right. I read the play over carefully that night, and the next morning after breakfast I sought out the American woman. She was on the putting green, and I came up behind her silently and took her arm. She gave an exclamation. Could I see you alone? I asked in a low voice. She nodded cautiously and followed me to a secluded spot. You've found out something, she breathed. I've found out, I said triumphantly, the name of the murderer. You mean it wasn't Macduff? she said. Macduff is as innocent of those murders, I said, as Macbeth and the Macbeth woman. I opened the copy of the play, which I had with me, and I turned to Act Two, Scene Two. Here, I said, you will see where Lady Macbeth says, I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. Do you see? No, said the American woman bluntly. I don't. But it's simple, I exclaimed. I wonder I didn't see it years ago. The reason Duncan resembled Lady Macbeth's father as he slept is that it actually was her father. Good God, breathed my companion softly. Lady Macbeth's father killed the king, I said, and hearing someone coming, thrust the body under the bed and crawled into the bed himself. But, said the lady, you can't have a murderer who only appears in the story once. You can't have that. I know that, I said, and I turned to Act Two, Scene Four. It says here, Enter Ross with an old man. Now that old man is never identified, and it is my contention he was old Mr. Macbeth, whose ambition it was to make his daughter queen. There you have your motive. But even then, cried the American lady, he's still a minor character. Not, I said gleefully, when you realize that he was also one of the weird sisters in disguise. You mean one of the three witches? Precisely, I said. Listen to this speech of the old man's. On Tuesday last, a falcon towering in her pride of place was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. Who does that sound like? It sounds like the way the three witches talk, said my companion reluctantly. Precisely, I said again. Well, said the American woman, Maybe you're right, but I'm sure I am, I said. And do you know what I'm going to do now? No, she said. What? Buy a copy of Hamlet, I said, and solve that. My companion's eyes brightened. Then, she said, you don't think Hamlet did it? I am, I said, absolutely positive he didn't. But who, she demanded, do you suspect? I looked at her cryptically. Everybody, I said and disappeared into a small grove of trees as silently as I had come. The Preoccupation of Mr. Pepifos 
In a time when everything should be made as simple and uncomplicated as possible, the Connecticut Telephone Company has taken to changing a lot of peaceful old rural phone numbers, which had been doing all right the way they were. For several years, I have known by heart the number of some friends of mine who live in a quiet little house out in the country, eight miles from town, New Milford 905, Ring 4, a pleasant number, easily remembered and easily spoken. When I called it the other day, I was told the number had been changed to New Milford 1006, W1, New Milford 1006, W1. Lots worse things have happened to me, but not many that I keep thinking about more often. I have slowly built up in my mind a picture of the official in Hartford who thought up that change. His name, as it comes to me in dreams, is Rudwool Y. Pethethos. Pethethos, who has had to go through a lot of hell, not only on account of the name Pethethos, but also on account of Rudwool, the Y is for Yermerm, has had to compensate for what has happened to him in this life. Working up relentlessly and maliciously to an important post in the number-changing department of the Connecticut Telephone Company, he has decided to get back at the world for what he conceives it has done to him. He spends the day going through phone books looking for simple, easily remembered numbers like 905 Ring 4, and when he finds one, he claps his hands and calls in his secretary, a Miss Rettig. Take a number change, Miss Rettig, he says with an evil smile, New Milford 905 Ring 4 to be changed to Pussymeister W7 08096J4. 